Okay, hello, Catherine. Welcome to the Lola Community Podcast. I am so excited that you're here. Here is my copy. It is the good news about bad behavior, why kids are less disciplined than ever, and what to do about it. So here's the deal with this book. I had it in my Amazon cart for a few weeks, and then I was like, no, I don't need any more books. And I was like, yes, I want that book. No, yes. Like I went back and forth. I don't know if you ever do this. Um, but eventually I pressed buy <laughs> and Good. I read it in like a week, super fast. And then oh. I became, and then I like obsessively like started Googling you. And I also love the other people who gave your quotes. Like I've met Bridget. I'm, I stalk her. I've read Jessica's book. I stalk her. <laughs> um, and so then my, one of my best friends is a parent coach. And so I reached out to her and said, Hey, do you know this Catherine? Cause sometimes, you know, you'll know the scoop of the person and they'll say, yeah, they're totally like, not right. They'll know me, you know. She was like, "Oh, she's so nice. She reached out about my book." So I thought, okay. I gave the book to my husband the next day and said, "You need to read this stat." And then I took the link and emailed it. I have um probably about ten principals that I'm quite close with in the D.C. area mm -hmm. from my years in education, and I wrote to them and the twenty teachers that I'm friends with and said, "Buy and read and do this book stat." for your parents, for the school. You guys have to know about this. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you spreading the word. That's wonderful. I know I'm a stalker in a funny <laughs> way. I share good things. I'm a crazy curator, I say. No, it's wonderful. That's what the world needs. So why did you write this book? Tell everybody what was the, what was the intention behind it? Well, truly, it all began with me trying to understand my own chaotic, you know, disobedient children. And I started really trying to understand discipline and behavior way back when my 12 year old was three and um, just very different than either of her siblings. And um, and that led me to the parent encouragement program. Yeah. And I took lots of classes there. And when you take enough parenting classes, they finally say, you've run out of curriculum, you must now teach classes. <laughs> and so along the way, I became a certified parent educator and just started moving my writing practice as a journalist more and more in the direction of kids, parenting, education, behavioral health, mental health. And it was when I was writing a story for Washington Parent about school discipline and how do you handle it when discipline at school is different from discipline at home that I came across Rock, Ross Green, Dr. Ross Green, who's a main psychologist who works with the most oppositional and defiant kids. And um, we had an amazing interview. At the end of our interview, he mentioned that he was moving his whole family, giving up his practice, giving up his position at Harvard and um, moving to Maine to implement his model in schools there. And I was just impressed by his commitment and started talking to principals and school counselors who used his model and they just raved. And as a journalist, when you find that many people who are raving about something, um, you just start getting excited. So I flew to Maine and followed him and some of the um, educators who use his model. And that ended up being the article that I wrote for Mother Jones Magazine in 2015 called The End of Punishment. And the magazine, they were wonderful to work with. They put it online as, what if everything you knew about disciplining kids was wrong? And it went viral and ended up getting to date more than 6 million page views, um, the most read story they've ever published. And so that found, landed me an amazing literary agent. And we worked on a proposal and uh, sold the book to public affairs. So that sort of was my path. But it really all stemmed from my own desire to yeah. figure out my own kids. Totally. I think so many of these things that resonate at the core of our work and our lives and our true passion are because of that personal desire or that yes. personal need or that question. Um, and I know that's the case, you know, I'm like very much steeped in the yoga, Ayurveda, spirituality world. And mm -hmm. that's the case for so many of my most favorite teachers and true for my own story in terms of questioning, like, the meaning of life and how do we make it better and why are we here? You know, right. that kind of really light coffee talk. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. The easy questions. Um, one of the things I, I want to actually ask you about the model and have you talk about a little bit um, that you saw in Maine because the stories 
from the families and the teacher. Oh, it was, it was just, I felt like I was in the room and I could smell the room. I just loved it. I love oh, your writing good. style. Thank you. And the other thing I just wanted to say is I love the research that you did also. The stuff that you found on empathy and holding the hand. Oh man, that, I mean, I get the chills even talking about it because I have a very fiery son and he's, probably not in the right school because he leaves every day overstimulated and mm -hmm. kind of a hot mess. Yeah. And so for the, for years, I've just walked him home. I say nothing. I just hold his hand and he yells and he screams wow. and he cries and he fully expresses. Uh, and so when I read the holding your hand research in the book, I remember the moment I was in bed, I was crying and I turned to my husband and I was like, I've been doing the right thing. I feel like I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm yeah. doing the right thing. And so just from my heart, I just fell in love with that. So talk a little bit about Dr. Green's model and, um, some of the research that you found. Yeah. Oh, that's so moving. Thank you for sharing that. I, myself, I'm very much the same way. You know, someone can tell me what to do, but I want to know why, you know, why does it work? What is, what is the, the why behind why we should change our parenting practices, why we should do something different than was done with us when we were growing up. And um, it, it really was Dr. Green who first got me questioning the decades of, you know, experience that I had in thinking about how we deal with kids. So his central thesis is that kids behave well if they can, not if they want to. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are stuck in a model of we need to make them want to behave more. So with the carrot or the stick, the reward or the punishment somehow, as if we need to motivate kids to behave and please us, right? When all kids want to do is to be accepted, to belong in their family, in their school. And so when kids aren't doing that, it's because they can't. Mm -hmm. So his whole model rests on that foundation that children who are not meeting the expectations in a situation can't. Either they don't have the skills mm -hmm. or there's something in the environment that needs to change. And the way he teases out, um, his model is called collaborative and proactive solutions. And there's three steps. Number one, um, he calls the empathy step, which is basically sharing with the kid, you know, I've noticed that there's something going on with transition from recess back into the classroom. And you seem really upset and you're walking around, it's hard for you to settle down. What's up with that transition? And really inviting the child's perspective and trying to understand from that, their point of view, what's happening. And then you share your concerns. Well, you know, we need to run a school here and the kids, it's disruptive to the kids in the class if you're walking around or screaming and, and you know, then brainstorm, what can we do? What could we try that would help you to get into your desk work sooner. And um, he always starts with the toughest problem. So when there's a kid who's oppositional or acting out, often there's 10 things that they are doing, right, that are challenging for us as adults. So you list every single difficulty the child is having, and then you start with the most difficult one and you solve that first. And it's not that the other ones are okay or that you endorse them or you accept them. It's that they're not on the front burner yet. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was just a wonderful shift in perspective because often parents will say, what, it's okay? If you're accepting that he's talking to you this way or that it's okay to scream in our family, you know? But truly, we cannot control children. We can't control anyone other than ourselves. So all we can do is look for the solution that's going to help them and um, start with the toughest pain point first. So um, that's a little sort of nutshell of his model. And obviously, there's much more in the book and, and the article I wrote um, that's online. And uh, the research on empathy for me also is just a game changer that um, we are such social animals that when we feel rejected, excluded, not understood, socially ostracized, it looks inside our brains as if we were hurt. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they've shown that on all these MRI studies. Mm -hmm. Conversely, the, the study out of the University of Virginia by um, Dr. Jim Cohen found that, um, you know, when, when someone holds our hand, it helps our brain to self-regulate, which to me just is mind blowing. So mind -blowing. he put women into an MRI machine and told them, you might be getting a shock on your foot. And you might imagine their brains go right into that fight or flight state their amygdala lights up 
And so they're lying there waiting to be shocked in a very dysregulated state of mind. And when your amygdala is acting up and you're dysregulated, you are not able to access your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that plans, problem solves, thinks creatively, makes good choices, you know, as we're always telling children to do. And um, so it's just not a state of mind where you're going to um, be thinking logically. So one group of women were allowed to hold their spouse's hand while they were lying there waiting for a shock. And it was just remarkable to see that the level of amygdala activity was way down. Something about holding their loved one's hand was helping their brain to regulate or keeping their brain in a regulated state. And then the third group of women had a stranger holding their hand. And even they were showing a level of dysregulation in the middle. So even a total stranger offering us empathy, physical contact, and acceptance is able to help our brain to self-regulate. It's so powerful. As, as so many of these systems in our culture are being uprooted, and there's this return uh, or acknowledging of feminine uh, skills and feminine knowing and sort of divine mother type qualities coming more into our, the way that we talk. The research is proving so much of what we as mothers and caretakers and women, and, and it's not a male, female, it's just that energetic quality right. of right. like, oh, we're really honoring that there is something in caring for other humans with a sense of like, yeah, we are connected and this is how we thrive. And I think that because so much of our culture is separated and social media and these silos and all of this kind of like staying to yourself. I mean, we know that we're seeing that with the anxiety and depression and suicide and higher ed and all these areas. Yeah. Uh, and so having this type of, of research and understanding and sharing it so that people feel validated by that silent walk home, <laughs> holding the hand yeah. or laying in bed and holding the hand when the person is um, in a stress situation. It's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so funny because we've had decades of attachment research, right? And we know from observational science that this is true, but now the neuroscientists are starting to identify inside the brain, what are the mechanisms? And yeah. for those people who weren't persuaded by the attachment yeah. research, okay. Okay. You know, well, I'm no. like, let's be clear, neuroscience is sexy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a hot, like that makes a cover of time. Right, you know? exactly. That's the masculine with the integrating, like the feminine qualities, which is, you know, in the parables about masculine and feminine energy from the wisdom traditions, they say like delight and joy comes from the integration of mm -hmm. masculine and feminine, not from being too far on either side. So that's what I love when we can bring together the qualities of the research that we know from that human side. Yeah. What, was there anything else that, was there anything that surprised you or shocked you or really stuck with you when you were doing the research or when you were doing the writing? Well, certainly the big light bulb moment for me um, when I was sort of trying to understand why are my kids so defiant? Wait, why are the other kids in my child's elementary school so chaotic? They're sort of not, behaving the way I would have expected um, based on my own experience as a child, you know, 30 years ago, um, was when I found this National Institutes of Health study on um, kids' behavioral and mental health that found one in two kids will have a mood or behavioral disorder by 18. So that was a study of more than 10,000 children, representative sample of the United States, and one in two kids. So that means every other child in my kids' kindergarten class by the time they graduate from high school is going to be managing something pretty significant yeah. with regard to their thoughts, behavior, or emotions. And um, that to me was just the proof that we need to change our practices to really give kids more support in learning to manage their big emotions and their worried thoughts and their impulsive behavior and lots of practice making mistakes. So they're going to mess up, they're going to lose it, and then they'll learn. And, um, and for those people who say, well, that's just overdiagnosis, I counter with the statistics on the suicide rates. As you mentioned, you know, the suicide rate has doubled in the last decade for kids 10 to 14 years old. And it's gone up 41% for children 15 to 18. So to me, that's the 
alarm bell that we just had children in a crisis of self-regulation and we need lots more tools. And the good news that I promise in the title of my yeah. book is there are so many strategies, yeah. you know, from mindfulness and yoga and, you know, breathing to so many other strategies, self-regulation tools, or even just, you know, knowing yourself, I need a good hard run when I'm feeling like this. Yeah. So we need to ourselves learn that if we're managing a mood or behavioral issue, it's not that we're broken. Uh, it's not the end right. of the conversation. Right. It's the beginning. We need to manage our brain chemistry and help our kids find the tools to manage theirs. Yeah. And I think this is why, so from an Ayurvedic perspective, we look at the world through these energies or the doshas or constitutions. And I love how Ayurveda approaches imbalances, which are the rise of these statistics, is that we've got these imbalances in vata and kapha dosha. Um, typically, that's what it would look like. Anxiety tends to be an out of balance vata and depression and out of balance kapha. Living in the future or living in the past, you know, we have all this kind of for me, learning about this ancient wisdom that integrates with these current rates that are that hurt my heart, yeah, um, helps me at least kind of show up every day to do this work, to be honest, is when I feel like pulling the covers over my head and being like, I can't, I don't know, does anything, does this matter? Look at the world. I'm like, get up, share a conversation, go connect with a human in real life, go meet a new friend, right? Like I did the positive psychology certification. So I'll kind of go through some of those checklists, like go create something, go help somebody, get out of your house. Um, and I think that, again, we sort of, take some of these things for granted or we yeah. poo poo them, but it really does make all the difference for the human connection piece. Yeah. Um, and one thing I'd love to hear your perspective on this. So one thing that's been really bugging me lately, and I'm scared to say this out loud because I might get pushback from some people who have said it to me lately. <laughs> is when I start to talk to them a little bit about empathy or holding a kid while they're freaking out or just breathing or relaxing or not sort of reacting, but more just pausing and gathering myself is, you know, people will say, I've heard a lot of people say things like, I don't understand why we're coddling them. Right. We're, we didn't get this and we're fine. Right. And it's the, we're fine that sometimes the coach in me wants to be like, actually, you just, I just watched you drink like eight drinks in 10 yeah. minutes yeah. after a stressful day and scream at your kid. So are you fine? Like yeah. I'm, I constantly, when I hear that, oh, I don't know why we're doing X, Y, or Z for kids because we didn't do that and we're fine, but I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of adult humans in my life who have a lot of pain and suffering. Yeah. And I'm not saying that drinking seven drinks in five minutes is good or bad. I'm just using an example right. <laughs> of buffers and- I'll go with bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little, but you know what I'm like, when we're buffering so extremely and we're treating other humans not with compassion, and then we're saying like, this is bull, like we're yeah. all fine. We don't understand what the big news is big deal is. I'm confused about that because I did read the, the coddling of the American mind, mm -hmm. the John Smith and Hype book. Mm -hmm. And I do agree with pieces of that. So there's not necessarily these extremes, but what do you think about all that? Yeah. I love this question. And it's, I hear it a lot also. And I'll tell you first what I say to those people, because okay. you yeah, can't I'm really ready. tell someone you're not fine because that's a very hard thing to hear. Totally. And who am I to know if they are or they're not right? right? Using my own judging life. Right. <laughs> So I say, well, the kids today did not have the advantages that we had, which mm. were to play outdoors in nature with other children, which is how kids have always learned social and emotional skills. They, you know, I was able to walk home from school with my brother. We made ourselves a snack. We walked, fought over guiding light or GI Joe totally. and did our homework if we felt like it. So we had a lot of autonomy. We yeah. had experience making those decisions, managing our time. So we were building our executive function and our social and emotional skills. And kids today are from the minute they wake up to the minute they fall asleep, they are supervised and directed. So, so they don't have that autonomy and the experience of practicing. So that's number one is the disappearance of childhood play. Number two is the growth in social media and technology, which we know is associated in research studies with anxiety, depression, and attention problems. And it's not just sort of 
demonizing social media or technology because it's our reality that we live in. But it's just acknowledging that when we are scrolling through Instagram or we are playing a video game for two hours, it affects our brain. And we need to have a feedback loop for us as adults and also to teach our children. When you are focusing outside yourself, when you're looking at YouTube to decide what should I be, or you're trying to, you know, even reading magazines, pop culture that tells you how to dress, and you're not looking inside yourself, what feeds my passion? How am I intrinsically motivated? Those intrinsic focuses are going to be associated with mental health and well-being. And whenever we're extrinsically focused, we are sliding towards that depression, anxiety, you know, axis. And we need to just be mindful. Um, so kids need limits on technology, um, starting when they're very young. And then they need practice getting more exposure to it and learning how it feels and starting to limit themselves. Mm -hmm. And then the third big factor that's changed um, in the last 20, 30 years, as we've seen this rise in um, anxiety, depression, and the like, is the, that kids are really unemployed. So childhood is not about contrib contribution, you know, how you belong in your family, what you do that makes a difference to the people you love. It's instead about performance and achievement. And we, it's great for our kids to achieve. We want them to do well academically and athletically and be gifted musically and in the arts, but it has to be again balanced by how do you matter in your family? Are you watching a younger sibling? Are you helping get dinner on the table? Are you um, helping a neighbor with their trash or their leaves? Right. You know, and, and those simple things that kids used to do on a regular basis, they're not doing because we parents either do it for them because they're going to mess it up or take too long or not do it perfectly, or because we want to free up their time for the extracurriculars that they're doing or the academics that are just overloading their schedule. And so we need to defend their free time to both play and to do those kind of mundane responsibilities that teach them life skills and teach them that they matter. Totally. I love that so much. And just the, we have, I think it was after I read the gift of failure or how to raise an adult, you know, mm -hmm. I have a, a theme here. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and they're both wonderful. And, <laughs> totally. and now I'm, I'm totally done now. I'm going on a depth year. I just announced it today. I'm not buying any more nonfiction for a whole year. Oh, wow. I'm going back, well, six months I'm starting. Okay. <laughs> I'm going back to everything that we already have and I'm going to re-implement and integrate, but I'm just like super excited about this. So part of it will be going back through, but I think it was after we read how to raise, maybe how to raise an adult, um, the, the, what kids should be able to do. I yeah. do have a chart like that in the back of your yeah. book too, right? Yeah. I folded it over. Um, and it's just so amazing how I I'm catching up. I'm going to just be honest about it is especially with my younger one, the seven year old, who had asthma, who was a hungry baby. He was cranky. He's got more pizza. He used to have to be on a nebulizer and sit mm -hmm. for treatment. So he has all this history of like being babied and not doing enough and right. blah, blah, blah. And then the health stuff. And so I looked at the stuff for him and was like, yeah, he's not doing all this. <laughs> uh, so well, I hope nobody will come to my house and audit my children because <laughs> they don't necessarily all do. They don't, with a checklist. Okay, right. <laughs> year, I'll come to your house and you'll come to mine. And we'll <laughs> but I do use it. I just have to say that I use it. Um, as a guide to remember to keep slowly moving. Cause that's right. kind of what I wanted to say to you next was like, what do you think? Okay. So let's just put all the barriers for this change on the table. What are all the reasons why people can't do this? Right. They say, I can't let my kids play outside because it's unsafe or because there's no other kids in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They have to be in these scheduled activities or they'll fall behind. They won't get into the advanced sports league or the you know dance class. And I, to that I say, you have to be courageous enough mm -hmm. to lead your family and not succumb to fear. Mm -hmm. And if we're just leading our families with fear-based parenting, then we're teaching our kids anxiety. I mean, it's no wonder that anxiety is the biggest problem of all those mood and behavioral issues mm -hmm. because we are... Um, defensively parenting. So I need my kid to be great at this so they get into this school instead of saying, my child needs to play because that's the work of childhood. Yeah. And, and I'm going to be courageous enough to be the first parent on the block to have an unscheduled um, two afternoons a week. It's not that much to ask. Yeah. 
And we did this and we found that other parents saw our kids outside and instead of calling social services, they let their kids outside. And so now there's much more free play in our neighborhood. Mm. And, um, and yes, it takes time to teach kids to do household tasks and it takes patience. And we have to just commit to that. And I love what you said about moving steadily in the right direction, because it doesn't have to be a wholesale change. It can be every month you'll learn a new task. Right. And then it's yours. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, ask the kids where they want to start. It doesn't need to be like, you have to do this. It can just be an totally. invitation. Hey, you want to do laundry with me this yeah. Saturday so that you can learn how to do it. And that I know sometimes I fold the clothes the way you don't like, so you can do it yourself from now yeah. on. Or do what we do, which is shove them in the drawer and close them. Right. Drawer. <laughs> <laughs> I've known to do that. Um, but I also think that part of the reason, what I love about the approach of interconnectedness and the Ayurvedic approach of everything is connected is that one of the barriers that I see is these, is that parents are overworked. Yes. Parents are overwhelmed. Parents are not, don't have the strategies yes. for, regulation, for relaxation. Parents don't have scheduled or unscheduled downtime. I call yeah. it scheduled downtime because I have a lot of fiery energy. So if I schedule the downtime, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> but if I don't schedule it, I won't do it because I'll find something else to fill it in. So I like work with my mind that way, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's what I mean is like, yeah, the, I know that there's a lot of women who are going to listen to this who are at work or on their, on their carpool or on the way home. And we're like, Oh, that's great. But that takes more time, you know, that I don't have. And so I just want to point out that there is a real, that we're really, I think that you and I are sort of linking arms in this. Like we're asking people to rise up and, and create some boundaries for their lives and pay attention that this is the childhood for your kiddo and that you are the leader. I always say you're the CEO of your family and your life you know, and to really say like enough, because these norms are just out of control. They're not helping people. Listen, if all those rates were, go I always say, if suicide and depression, and anxiety rates were going down, then I could stop doing this work and go frolic in the woods all day. Yeah. And I would love to do that. You know, I could become an artist or I don't know, like go do something super creative and fun <laughs> that doesn't have to do with elevating our spiritual life because we are in a crisis. Yeah. So that question of like, is that working for you to work so much and to not make time for these basics? I mean, we just see how much it's hurting our, our future and that I, I can't do that. Yeah. You know, no, it's so true. And I think when we really start to ask ourselves, do I have to do this or am I doing it yeah. because I think someone will judge me or because it's expected, um, then we really get honest with ourselves. And, you know, as simple as my daughter was refusing to brush her hair and I wasn't brushing her hair because it needed to be brushed. It was because of the judgment of all the other parents around me that I was afraid of. You know, and um, and I wasn't baking cookies for the bake sales because I love to bake. You know, it was because I, I thought that's what was expected. So the more we really focus on the long term, what I want for myself yeah. and my child in 25 years, that will keep our perspective on the right things. Um, actually, a good friend of mine has a book that's out today as we're recording this um, called Juliet's School of Possibilities. And it's not, it, it's fiction. So you can read it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a time management stable about our priorities yeah. and, and all the stories we tell ourselves about yeah. why we have to do what we want. And it's, I, yeah. her name's Laura Vanderkam, I highly recommend it because yeah. she's helped me change my own perspective on, you know, the many things that I take on. Yeah. And yeah. the one thing I'll say just to close this question is I, I spoke with a mom at an event recently who came up to me afterwards and said her 12 year old daughter said she just feels so overworked. She doesn't want to go to high school where she'll have to work harder and then go to college and then go get a job and just have her nose to the grindstone her whole life. And I said to the mom, yeah, I can understand that. <laughs> yeah. and we, we need to ask what vision of adulthood are we presenting our kids? Are yeah. we always exhausted, yeah. you know, overworked, not having hobbies, not having free time? Who would want to grow up? Totally. And become that person. Totally. We need to also model, like have a hobby, have a date night, enjoy 
yesterday we had such a beautiful afternoon in DC and I, my daughter came home with lots of homework and I just said, you know what? It's the first great afternoon. Let's just yeah. play catch in the front yard. And she didn't finish her homework. And you know what? It's She's fine. The end of the world. <laughs> Please don't get me started on that. That's a whole nother episode about this ridiculousness. So you should hang out with me. My kid has blue hair and has never brushed it. I think in her whole 11 years. So <laughs> people are always, and people are always like, Do in fact, it's so funny because my mother-in-law who is a deer at heart, but like follows her around with a hairbrush when she comes and it's just so our norm and not a value of mine and I don't brush my hair. So like, it's fine, whatever. But um, she is so funny because I don't even remember that that's like how she is, just how she looks to me and how she's always looked. And then when she follows her around, she's like, Sailor, don't you want to brush your hair? And Sailor's like, no, why? You know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden now she just turned 11 yesterday. Now um, I notice she closes her door before school and she comes out and her hair is very, it's been clearly brushed. So like, again, that sort of like, she's not doing it because I'm telling her to, or the mo my mother-in-law is, it's just, she has decided that she'd like to take care of herself in a different way now. Right. right. So I love seeing those little micro moments and movements yeah. of them getting to be fully expressed and to real, I mean, yes, we, it, it is time to sort of let go. If again, the research on homework is hilarious. Yeah. It's like, this does not matter. Why yeah. are you still doing it? The schools are so outdated. I can't, <laughs> I yeah. can't with what they're asking some of our kids to do. And honestly, a lot of times they're doing it because the parents have demanded more homework. <laughs> that's how they assess, you know, oh my gosh, my elementary school is so good because my second grader oh. has two hours of homework a night. Well, why are you using that as a measure of what your child is learning? Oh. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> Um, clearly I'm very passionate about this topic. And in fact, I might even be pulling my child from the best public school in Washington, DC to yeah. homeschool him next year, just to give him a breather. Yeah. I'm trying to find a good fit for a school and I'm having a really hard time and I, yeah. I'm like super practical. So I'm really not going to pay $40,000 just to have the same exact experience in another right. place that has a fancier name. Right. That's right. not my jam. Um, and so I'm trying to figure it out. It's yet to be determined. Um, what, so tell me now the book has been out a few years. No. Um, also almost one year. So it's one year going to be, it was, came out last April and it's okay. coming out in paperback on April 9th. Oh, this. great. Yeah. Awesome. And what are you working on now? Are you doing this? Are you implementing this? What, tell me what's happening with your life since then. Oh, thanks for asking. I am still doing a lot of speaking about the book, but it's definitely yeah. slower than it was, um, you know, the first six months of the book launch. I think I talked in like 40 different places. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I'm starting to work on other projects. So I have mm -hmm. an article in development and I'm pulling together material uh, that I hope will be another book. But mm -hmm. this book took me um, five years to, you know, from start to finish. So I'm trying to also just be really um, understanding with myself that if it feels like I have no idea what this book will be, that's because this is the stage I'm in. Totally. Um, you know, and I also, because I've been traveling a lot, do want to be with my kids, you know, yeah. and, and um, they have life events, you know, that we're totally. planning for. We have a bat mitzvah in May that we're getting ready for. So I'm working on that. And Mazel tov. Thank you. <laughs> That's a lot of work. That's a full-time job. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I'm trying to just, you know, enjoy every aspect of my life. Totally. And, um, do you and, think you'll continue to write on the subject? Or do you feel like you're a journalist, like you want to switch gears? Like how does your process work for projects. I yeah I I am still obsessed with this subject okay, so cool, I cool, think cool, cool. the next book will be a similar kind of um bent and maybe getting a little more specific because I think this book was very much an overview and it's yeah. narrative journalism yeah. so I'm yeah. trying to tell a story and often then people say okay well what about the specifics for my kid and they're you know it's not a manual right it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's sort of helping you to change your frame of mind. And so for the next book, I might try to take people into the lives of kids who are learning to manage themselves and, oh, and what exactly does that look like? Oh, nice. So more practical of that day to day. For yeah, exactly. And sort of stories of families that are um, maybe making this a higher priority. That would be super powerful, especially because we learn so well in storytelling. Yeah. And I think that, um, again, sort of like 
putting, you know, raising our hand and saying like, I'm going to share that I'm doing this a little bit more. I'm doing this differently is a really powerful theme because then it helps other families say like, okay, now at least I know one person. That's how I felt about exploring homeschooling. When I yeah. first thought of it, it was like, no, I don't know anybody. Then said, well, let me start talking to people. So I talked to women who run their own business and are homeschooling and figuring out like, oh, could that work? And how would that work? And hearing myself in their story has been super powerful. So I love pulling those threads down into, into daily life. Um, so, and I just, Laura Vanderkamp, the same 168 hours. Yes. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I like that. Wonderful. I like that whole, this whole idea of we don't have time. Really? How, tell me what you're doing with your time. Right. Boom. <laughs> oh, okay. And I use that in my clients all the time. I'm like, tell me what you do. And then they do. And they're like, oh, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's just a story I tell myself. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. So to close, what do you want these amazing families, these women who are listening, mostly women, um, what do you want them to take away? What do you want them to know? Obviously they're going to buy the book. That's a given. But is there anything that you want to say from your heart to theirs? Oh gosh. Um, really just that so often we respond to our child's behavior from a place of fear and we think either you know my kids acting out or they're having anxiety and and that means i did a bad job right i'm not a good parent i i messed up or you spin out and catastrophize 20 years my kid's going to be in a van down by the river you know mm -hmm. and instead if we can look at their behavior or their challenges from a lens of, oh, okay, they're sending a signal that this is what they need help with. So this is a new skill that they need to learn, a social and emotional skill, or maybe they are yearning for more connection with me and, and they need something. So it's, it's actually a good thing when your kid is struggling or acting out or you're hitting a bump in the road because then you know what to do. It's, it's not hidden on the surface and, and, and being suppressed. You have an assignment. <laughs> and, and that's all of us, you know, moms who research and want to learn and do the best for our kids. We love assignments. Then we, we say, okay, my assignment is to be the detective, figure out what my child needs right now and, and, and get and help them get it. And that as our kids grow, and we hit more and more of those bumps, then we're building their, their toolkit for surviving and thriving in life. So by the time they're 18, they will have figured out all the strategies that they need to manage their emotions, to you know, handle their thoughts and to stay organized and manage their impulses and control their behavior. So it's really the journey we have to be on and it's, it's not a problem and it's not something that, that we messed up on. It's just the task of our era of parenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that um, projection of like my kid is my worth or my value or where they go to school or where they get in or it, it's really from a spiritual perspective, it's just so enmeshed because that's not really how souls are, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that has been super helpful to me just from a mindset of being like, okay, she is who she is and I'm of course um, providing an environment for growth and development. But the truth is, I don't know what her, what challenges she will face. Um, and so how do we, it's like what we said earlier in terms of like, you can, you can't control other people's emotion, yeah. you know, and that feels really scary for people. Yeah. Um, especially when they can't, they don't know how to work with their own. That's right. really what that right. is a mirror of, you know? And I have the benefit of having gone to an elite college and so in the first year, there so many people flamed out, you know, because they had been pushed so hard yeah. all through high school and either they just had nothing left to give or yeah. suddenly for the first time, nobody was directing them and they just collapsed. And yeah. that's not what we want for our kids. Mm -hmm. you know, we want them to leave our homes ready. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for the work. Thank you for this beautiful book that I love. Thank you. That my husband loves. Woohoo! Something on the same page. <laughs> um, and please keep us updated for future. I'll post links to your website. 
Is it your name, Catherine Reynolds? Yeah, CatherineRLewis.com. And then I have Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as well. So. Wonderful. Yeah. I'll post that. And I'm also going to post when I do, when we release this, I'm going to post on Instagram. You know how you can do multiple pictures? I'm going to post the age appropriate jobs for people too. Because I think right. that's super powerful for yeah. people to see in real life. And then they say, oh, I need to print this out. So hopefully that will be helpful to people's um, real life. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. So glad to connect with you. And thanks you for too. sharing your time with us. Yay. Mm -hmm. Take care. Okay. Bye.